In this video, we're going to talk about a fallacy that often is not recognized as such, but just viewed as some other thing, like a rhetorical technique or somebody being a jerk. Uh, we're going to talk about the appeal to ridicule. So we'll do eight main things as usual in this video. We'll talk about what the appeal to ridicule is. We'll look at the argument structure of it. Then we'll talk about a little bit more detailed reasons why it's a fallacy. What's going wrong with that? We'll examine some common situations in which you can expect to see it arise. We'll look at three examples of the fallacy so that you can do a little bit of getting your head around this with, with concrete uh, examples. We'll talk about how to spot it, what to be on the lookout for. For those of you who are students who need to be able to distinguish this from other fallacies, we'll talk about how to do that. And we'll finish by talking about how to avoid falling into this, this type of fallacy in your own reasoning, your own communication, your own life. So, what is the appeal to ridicule? Um, it's got a few names. These are kind of funny names. Horse laugh, you know. Uh, why would a horse laugh be involved? Well, there's a whole story there we won't go into. Reductio ad ridiculum, literally the, the reduction to, to laughableness, and the appeal to mockery. So what, what's going on here? We have a claim or an argument that's being rejected not by actually attending to the basis or the, the legitimacy of the claim as such, but rather by distracting the audience and perhaps even oneself or the person that you're engaging with by engaging in joking or mockery or sarcasm, satire or ridicule, humor in other words, is being used as a way to distract somebody. Now, this humor can be directed at the claim itself, or at some feature of the claim, or it might be directed at the person who's making the claim, or potentially it could be directed at other things, but it's being used to distract. So, um, what structure does this have? You notice that it's not very complicated, but there is one hidden premise here that we want to call attention to. The first premise is that certain person A, you will call him, is making claim X. And then you point out, well, look how funny or silly or ridiculous either A or X is. And then you say, well, then X is false. We don't have to take A or we don't have to take X into consideration. Now, how do you get from those two premises that are explicit to that, that conclusion? You need a bridge premise, uh, an implicit premise, something that's being assumed, which is that if A or X is ridiculous, then somehow that makes claim X false. When you put it that way, you can see that this is actually quite poor reasoning. If we look at it in a graphic term, we've got two people, person A and person B. Person B is the one engaging in the fallacy. Person A is making some sort of claim, X. And person B, instead of attending to the claim, points out some feature of A or X that is laughable. We see that hidden premise there again. If A or X is laughable, then X is false. And we get to the, the wrong conclusion, the, the unwarranted conclusion that X is false. Now, why is this a fallacy? I think you can already see, based on what I've said so far, why that's the case. But let's, let's talk about this in a bit more detail. <clears throat> so a claim, we, we always want to remind ourselves, a claim being true or false requires some sort of basis for, for thinking that it's true or false. And it can often be true or false independently of the things that come up in a fallacy. In this case, the claim is either true or false or you know unknown or whatever, based on something other than whether it's funny or not, right? Um, it's independent of whether there's anything funny about the claim or the person making the claim. Because, I mean, think about it. If you were to take the same claim and you say it in a silly voice, does that suddenly make the claim false? No, of course not. It's the claim has to stand on its own basis. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that the person who is engaging in the fallacy is distracting the audience and perhaps themselves from considering and evaluating the claim on its own merit. So there's kind of a, a higher order failure going on, a dispositional failure of critical thinking as well. Now, what are common situations in which this is going to arise? Well, uh, as a rule, you can say that, that it occurs in situations in which there's some sort of funny aspect that you can latch onto, either with the claim or the subject or the person making the claim. So there's probably certain subjects that are more uh, low-hanging fruit, as they say, for this sort of thing. Um, now, the kind of context that this can appear in are, are extremely wide. 
personal relationships and arguments. Somebody makes some sort of claim about, you know, who should take out the trash or who should be doing the laundry. And you, you know, point out that they've got a funny nose or, you know, the laundry uh, wouldn't need to be done so often if they, if they, uh, you know, weren't such a slob and you say it in kind of a joking voice. Those are, you know, appeals to ridicule. Um, advertising and marketing used all the time in advertising. We see this constantly being employed in part because humor tends to produce a kind of uh, good feeling about stuff. You know, one of the best ones is that that condom commercial with the kid in the store who's, you know, being a pain to his dad. It's, a, it's in a, some foreign language. I'm not sure which one it is, but he is just being a rotten little, little brat. And, you know, you don't know what the commercial's about until it finally cuts to the end. It's for some some brand of condoms, and the you know the idea is well, you should um, you know you should uh, use this this brand of condoms. There there, it's not so much an appeal to ridicule; it's, it's using humor as a device. But you get the idea. Advertising will oftentimes try to discredit their competitors by making them look silly, by you know arguing that people who would who would want to be engaged with them are kind of kind of goofy or there's something ridiculous about them. Politics and policy making. Boy, this is, you know, if you can come up with one-liners to deflate your opponents uh, fairly reliably, you're probably going to go far in, in politics, whether it's, you know, political politics or office politics or whatever. Um, but it's not good uh, argumentation there. Um, the workplace. People use this all the time, you know, putting each other down, making fun of each other. Um, you know, you can you can point out some you have a rival and you're both, you know, putting proposals forth to the boss and you find something in, in the way that, that your your uh, opposed presenter put forth their ideas and, and, and make fun of it. And then you maybe get the account. Um, film and television narratives used all the time. This kind of overlaps with the personal life, particularly in sitcoms, but it can be used in a lot of other things as well. Um, school situations, um, sports, entertainment, all these sorts of things are common situations where you can expect to see the appeal to ridicule. Let's look at some examples now. So this one's straight out of Beavis and Butthead. I don't know if they actually made this joke, but it's the kind of joke that they would make. And uh, I'm, by the way, I'm a fan of Beavis and Butthead. Um, I, I kind of like the show, but I, I don't, you know, view it as a good example of critical thinking. So the, imagine the teacher is saying, I consider it my duty to inform you that your current grades are going to result in you failing this course and repeating the 10th grade. And then either Beavis or Butthead says, ah, he said duty. He's got a duty and he wants to give us his duty. No way, man. And the conclusion is, well, we're not going to have to repeat the 10th grade. Clearly false in their case, right? Um, since they've been in the 10th grade or maybe the 11th grade, I'm not sure which, uh, for the entirety of their show. Um, here's another one that's really interesting from politics. This happened a long time ago. And a lot of people nowadays seem to think that it was Reagan who said this to Mondale. Reagan had some other zingers that he used with Mondale. This is this was in an election campaign in 1984 uh, where Reagan won by such a landslide um, that it hasn't, you know, th that was the last election where somebody just totally trounced their opponent. But the guy that he trounced, trounced somebody else first. Mondale was uh, the front runner, and Gary Hart was this other Democratic politician who was, you know, rapidly rising in the polls. And at the same time, Wendy's had come out with this famous Where's the Beef commercial. It's something you can Google. You can you actually see the, the commercial. There's a tiny little, you know, uh, hamburger inside a giant bun. And the idea is that, you know, this is kind of trickery to, to provide somebody with a giant bun and a tiny little bit of meat. Mondale, who actually hadn't seen the ad, was told by his advisors that he ought to use this as a line. So he said to Gary Hart, what's so new about coming out for entrepreneurs? You know, when I hear your new ideas, you know, sort of scare quotes, I'm reminded of the ad, where's the beef? And this really took off. This was very effective. The conclusion was you can just ignore or dismiss Gary Hart's ideas. They're not really new ideas. Um, this was just an appeal to ridicule. Now, 
This is one that actually occurred to me when I was a kid, and I, I used to get in a lot of trouble, and I was thrown in with a bunch of other kids who'd gotten in a lot of trouble, and there was one who sort of prided herself on her, her elite uh, status because she you know, came from a good family and listened to classical music. So she said, I only listen to classical music, and I pointed it out because I was a metalhead. There's a lot of interesting connections between metal and classical music. And so what she said was, um, yeah, who rattled your cage, monkey? Shouldn't you be out somewhere breaking the law? You know, because that's a Judas Priest song, Breaking the Law. Show that she actually knew a little bit about heavy metal. Um, and the conclusion is metal and classical don't actually bear any interesting connections. It's, it's a way of just sort of sidestepping the issue. Um, let's talk now about how you can spot this fallacy when it's occurring. This is pretty easy to spot. Just look whether an issue or claim is being examined on its merits or whether the claim is uh, being dismissed through ridicule or humor of some sort. Somebody's laughing at somebody. Is that, is that the case? Well, you probably have an appeal to ridicule then. Be particularly on guard for this when considering arguments and claims being made in situations involving, by their very genre or their nature or their intention, comedy. You don't go to the White House, uh, you know, correspondence dinner um, expecting that there's going to be a lot of, you know, serious policy stuff being debated, right? Because it's there for people to joke around. Um, the Daily Show, great example of that. I know a lot of people would get their news from The Daily Show. Probably not the smartest thing to do because, you know, when Jon Stewart was in his, his heyday, um, he was actually covering stories, but he, you know, he had to put some sort of comedic spin on it, and it may not be giving you the, you know, the best view on it. Um, anything involving Bill Maher, you know, glaring case, um, he will, I mean, it's kind of debatable with him. This is a total tangent, but I don't know whether he um, is more invested in, in just, you know, trying to bash opponents and making the points that he makes or trying to be a funny guy. He doesn't do either one particularly effectively. He comes across as a very bitter uh, and, and, you know, um, you know, going for easy targets kind of guy. It's too bad because I actually liked him quite a bit when he first came out. Um, when you're enjoying good humor, nobody's saying, by the way, don't be funny, don't enjoy good humor. But when you're enjoying good humor, see whether the comedic point is really relevant to the matter under discussion or whether it's distracting from it. If you're trying to have a serious discussion where you're advancing some sort of claim, sometimes you got to put the humor aside. Um, now, what for you students who have to worry about not confusing this with other fallacies, what's not the appeal to ridicule? You notice I've got quite a few fallacies here that it's easy to mix it up with. One of these um, is the, the non sequitur fallacy. Non sequitur literally means does not follow. Two things are disconnected. They're not actually, uh, there's no intrinsic or, or you know, relevant connection between them. You're just throwing them together. Comedy sometimes looks like that a bit, right? So it, it would be easy to mistake it for that. I guess the, the dividing line would be is, is it funny or not, right? Um, sometimes you might mistake it for another fallacy that's similar called the red herring fallacy. Uh, in the red herring fallacy, some sort of interesting distraction is being introduced. In the case of appeal to ridicule, the key thing is that it involves humor. Um, the red herring may not necessarily involve humor, so if you have to pick between them, if there's uh, comedy going on, pick the appeal to ridicule. It also resembles the argument from outrage and the argument from incredulity. Why? Because they have similar structures, right? You're, you're just sort of like doing something, and somehow that's going to be relevant to the truth or falsity of somebody else's claim. Um, but in the case of the argument from outrage, you're, like, you're displaying some sort of outrage. You're getting all worked up, right? Um, in the case of the argument from incredulity, you've got that, oh, I can't believe you, you said that sort of thing, right? In this case, you're saying, ah, ha, 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 you're funny. Um, funny person, not so smart, right? Or, you know, you're not, you're not being truthful or we shouldn't believe you. So that's the difference between them. It's, it's not a difference in form. It's a difference in content. Um, you can also say that this resembles the straw man fallacy. The emphasis in the straw man fallacy is a little bit different, though. It's not just trying to, you know, take somebody down or, or ridicule them 
to say that a claim is false, you're doing that precisely so that you can make another claim look true by contrast. So if I am, you know, um, misrepresenting your argument so that I can make sure that my argument is the one that, that's being advanced, straw man fallacy. If I'm just attacking your argument by pointing out how, how you know, your face looks funny or you said it in a funny way or it's got funny words in it, that's the appeal to ridicule. It is, by the way, important to point out that you can make an argument employing humor or satire or sarcasm or that the audience laughs at without necessarily committing the fallacy. If you're actually dealing with the claims and, and the, you know, the argumentation on its own basis, but you're doing it in a sarcastic way, that doesn't make it into a, an appeal to ridicule. It's when there's a substitution of focusing on the humorous in place of considering anything substantive. Now, how do you avoid falling into this kind of uh, trap yourself, particularly if you're somebody who has a tendency towards you know, humor or enjoys that sort of thing? There's just a couple points here. One is be on guard against the temptation to score easy points by taking cheap shots against an opponent through humor or sarcasm when there's substantive issues up for a discussion. If there's substantive issues, try to deal with those uh, in an in a independent way. If you're going to be funny about it, don't make the humor so much that it steers the audience into thinking that the person doesn't know what they're talking about when perhaps they do. Also, remind yourself it's really easy to find things to laugh about when looking at people or positions that we disagree with, but that these are typically irrelevant to the matter under discussion. There's very few things, unless you're actually talking about whether something is funny or not, um, that are going to be, you know, decided by, by humor. Um, that's not a relevant consideration in most cases. Now, nobody's saying that you have to be a robot, turn off your sense of humor or anything like that. You know, I'm a big believer in Aristotle's dictum that there is a, a actual virtue of, of good humor or wit that lies in between the extremes of, you know, not appreciating humor at all, being, being a dull person and being a buffoon, a, a jackass. But, you know, you... Aiming for that happy medium requires that when we're trying to, you know, engage in things that, that give us pleasure, like like humor, we focus also on what the case is in front of us, that we don't get distracted by that or distract other people. The last thing that I want to say is that this video is part of a series discussing common fallacies in reasoning and argumentation, and it belongs to a whole channel devoted to critical thinking, logic, and argumentation. So if you enjoy this, this video, if you find it useful, if it helped you out, um, suggest it to other people, post it, share it, um, refer to it, and come back and check out our channel because we're going to be constantly adding new con content in these areas over the next several years.